gestation period and all the pain and inconvenience and the crazy hormones and all of that. And then there's all this pain and this labor. And then after great laboring, at last, the child is born. And then the child takes its first breath. And then normally screams, bellows, and starts to breathe and start to interact with the environment of this world. In the same way, there is some point in our lives, even if we're born into a Christian environment, there's some point in our lives where we stop and say, Lord, I accept what you've done. And I choose to trust and obey you. And I cry out to you now, Lord, and say, it's not what my parents have done. It's not the values they've taught me. It's you and you alone that give me life. And we trace the start of our new life back to that. That would then be the new birth, and that's the basis of, of our assurance. Let's talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, because often this is separated off from the issue of salvation. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus is truly God, then he truly is our example in all things. So what did he give us as the example of living a life of dependence on the Holy Spirit? Well, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Luke 1.35. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon him. His mother Mary was a virgin. She had no life within her in embryonic form. She was impregnated by the overshadowing presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So God, was not just, God did not just take on a human nature. He became birthed, born into the human race. He became fully human in as much as he was also fully God. So his very conception was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then for 30 years, at the age of 30, he begins his ministry. And for three and a half years, he ministers in absolute dependence on the Holy Spirit. I mean, just read through the Gospels. He says, I only do what my Father says. I only do what I see him doing. Uh, it says that sometimes he could do great and wonderful things, and sometimes he didn't. He sometimes selected one person for healing and ignored the many. At other times, he would heal a thousand people at a time. His whole ministry was totally dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. When he gets baptized, Luke's Gospel says, and he came up out of the water, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then it says, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. And then it says, and he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit and started to minister. So his whole ministry was based on the dependence on the Holy Spirit. And in um, Luke 5, 17, 6, 19, Mark 5, 30, and of course there are countless other occasions, you see this evidence of his ongoing ministry. Then, in Acts 1, 8, it says, And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the issue here is, how can we live this new life that he's given us if it's not lived in dependence on the Holy Spirit? I was so humbled um, when, as a, as a 30 year old, I, I got born again. Then um, I was uh, born again at a time when uh, Pat and I started attending an Assemblies of God church. And we were taught all about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, laying on of hands, and so on and so forth. And then I had a, a time when I went back to Cape Town for a holiday. And I had this big argument with my mom. And I'm saying to her, yeah, but mom, you know, you've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she's saying, well, I don't know about that, my boy. You know, in my day, it wasn't in, you know, it's kind of discussions going on. And then she stops and she says, but you know, i tell you what, I remember when I was about 19, and I, I was, I remember being born again as a very little girl. But when I was 19, I remember clearly saying, Lord, I cannot live this life unless you fill me with your Spirit. And I remember the difference that that made and I thought, oh, I'm so silly. Here I've been arguing the toss about these religious cliches that I've learned when my mom has actually been living the reality of that. She didn't call it being baptized in the Holy Spirit. She just experienced it and had been living her, her Christian life always in terms of that. 
I believe very fervently that it is the Holy Spirit who gives us this new birth. We are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. But as we start to live our Christian lives, we need to constantly be filled with His power. And it isn't this religious rite which happens where we have the second experience or the second blessing, whatever it is. It's an experience that we need to have constantly, many times, as we continue in our Christian walk. And I'm going to come back onto this tomorrow, because it's quite a big area in the Christian life, uh, and the manifestations of the Spirit and so on. So we'll, we'll deal with that a bit tomorrow. I want to go on to foundation number two, which is the Scripture. We'll talk about inspiration of the Scriptures. Again, let me give you four options. This book of 66, a collection of 66 letters, documents, histories, poetry, wisdom literature, apocalyptic literature, gospels, and so on, that we call the Bible. How inspired is it? Because the inspiration, the authority, and the sufficiency of the Bible is a foundation of the Christian faith. Again, if somebody said to you, what are the basic foundation building blocks of your Christian faith? You would say, first of all, hopefully, Jesus. And you'd say, it's to be born again of the Spirit. That's living a life of dependence and trust and obedience. Uh, how? How do we know that we need to be born again? How do we know how to live a life? Well, it's because the Bible says so. Right, so therefore the validity of the Scripture is a really important issue for us. So, is the Bible inspired in as much as Shakespeare was inspired? My daughter-in-law and son bought a gift for Pat's birthday the other day, which was two tickets to go to see Much Ado About Nothing. And truly, was Much Ado <laughs> About Nothing. And Shakespeare was such a clever fella. And I sat there listening to these words just washing out. And candidly, I hate confessing this, but first of all, I was exhausted. But secondly, at half time, I said to Pat, do you really mind? I'm just so battered by all, this, all these words and they mean nothing. It's nothing. It's just a whole bunch of clever words. Do you mind if we go? I just can't tolerate any more clever words. Now, the Bible is not just a bunch of clever words, is it? No, Shakespeare was a brilliant man. And he wrote these wonderful things of literature, which I'm obviously a barbarian that I don't appreciate. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm clearly a Philistine. <laughs> and that's obviously true. But is the, is the Bible just that? No. Okay, so me, let's give you another option. Do you think it is that God dictated then every word of the Bible? No. Um, frankly, if he were to have dictated the scriptures, I guess the first thing he probably would have done would have been to dictate them in some form of alphabetic dictionary. Because it seems to be an awfully messy arrangement. And if I was going to dictate a manual for life, I probably would create it as a dictionary. I'd probably have under A, all the things about angels and abstinence and Adam <laughs> and alcohol and all of that. I'd put all those under A's and, and I'd kind of work through it so that somebody could you know, look up all the things of, of life. Now, the Bible wasn't dictated word by word, and, and the evidence of that's quite obvious. As you start reading it, you can see that this is not um, a dictated work. What about then the fact that maybe it's the thoughts of the Bible that are inspired, but, but not the words? Well, words are the vehicles of thoughts, aren't they? How do we express thoughts? So it's really a bit of a nonsense to say, well, the thoughts are inspired, but the words aren't. I don't think you can make that artificial separation. So inspiration has got to go, be, it's not dictated, but it's got to go beyond just the grand ideas. It's got to go to a fair amount of the detail. It's got to go into a, quite a lot of how those thoughts were presented, otherwise they cease to be accurate thoughts. What about the concept that maybe, well, maybe only certain parts of the Bible are inspired? 
So maybe we should do what the heretics have done over the centuries. We should just take a nice pair of scissors and just cut out of it the parts that we deem to be uninspired. So, of course, ladies, would you clearly go straight to the writings of Paul <laughs> and you just chop out a whole bunch of stuff about women must be silent in church and all that. <laughs> Off that goes. And, and us guys, we, we go to Ephesians where it says, Husbands, love your wife, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We just snip that out. That's clearly not inspired. But when it says, Wives, obey your husbands, we say, Right on. And we underline that with a highlight pen. Now, I, I'm being facetious, but people have done that for the last 2,000 years of trying to select what bits we then decide to be the judge of Scripture. And, and there's, a, there's a group of theologians right now who meet every year. They're called the Jesus Seminar. And they go through the Gospels deciding which bits he actually said and did and which bits he didn't. And I have the sum total of their research on my bookshelf. Of all four Gospels, it comes down to about 17 pages. The rest, they say, is not what he said and did. They've just taken their own particular pair of, of scissors to it. So there's something terribly wrong with that as well. Simple foundation principle of Christianity is that all of the Bible is in spite of God. And the Bible is exactly as God wants it to be. And it's all we need for faith and life. We don't actually have to argue the toss as we so often do in the Christian world about the anomalies of scriptures, and there are anomalies in scripture. There are dates that don't coincide. There are witnesses that don't seem to correspond. There are numbers which differ from one place to the other. There are even some doctrinal issues which shift. That doesn't need to concern us. What concerns us as Christians is, is the Bible a reliable testimony of, to, and about Jesus Christ and his will for our lives? If the answer to that one is yes, it's inspired. I actually believe that part of the glory of the Bible is that God has allowed humanity into the process of producing it. So that in the scriptures we actually see humanity coming through. We see the personality of authors coming through. We see Paul saying and doing things which are not that good. We see Peter doing some strange things. And I, and I rejoice at that. I say, oh, I'm just so glad that that's in the Bible because I can relate to that. I can say, amen, Peter, I would have done exactly the same stupid thing. And the fact that it's in there is a testimony to its inspiration. That God has actually allowed all of it to be displayed there. All of our humanity, all of his glory in this one wonderful book. But believe me, the inspiration and authority and reliability of the scripture is a foundational principle. The minute we start walking away from that, the minute we start saying, well, you know, we'll just make our own decisions. We will lose the very essence of what we believe. And we'll wind up with some kind of customized mix and match faith, which we will call Christianity, and it probably won't be. Christianity is based on the Word of God. Jesus himself is the Word of God. But the Bible is the written revelation of that word made manifest in, in humankind. Where else can you read about Jesus? Have you ever tried to do a historic study? Have you ever tried to Google Jesus? Where else will you read about him? You will find a few lines in the records of the Roman government of the time. A few lines. You'll find one paragraph in the writings of Flavius Josephus, the, Roman his, the his, Jewish historian to the Romans in the year 70 AD. And you will find five other passing references to him in the writings of early Romans and Greeks. And that's it. We know about salvation. and We know about God made manifest on earth only through the scriptures. We cannot separate the sufficiency and the authority and the reliability of the Bible from the person of Jesus. The two sit 
close together in our faith. Okay, I want to get on to a practical question. And the practical question is, okay, so um, what version do we read? When I was a kid, in Sunday school, the only version of the Bible which everybody had was the King James Version. King James is written in flowing Elizabethan English, the same English as Shakespeare, and it's beautiful. Oh, it really is. I mean, the King James Version is beautiful English. Problem is, the, me the very meaning of the words have changed, and, and we just don't understand it. So people nowadays, if they're sort of younger than 60, tend to blow the dust off their King James and then put it back on the shelf because it's really hard to, to understand. When people translate the Bible, there's a continuum of translation. Uh, that represents that line on the chart that you're looking at. On the left-hand side is literalistic. On the right-hand side is paraphrase. There are two ways of translating. One's called formal equivalence. The other one's called dynamic equivalence. Okay, with formal equivalence, what the translator tries to do is go back to the original, as, as original as we can get, Hebrew and Greek, and to try and put that into the receptor language, in our case English, in as close a proximity to the actual words and the actual sentence construction. So, if the original Hebrew said, the ball hit by the boy was, if that's the way the original Hebrew was, then the King James will say, the ball hit by the boy was. So they'll try and retain the sentence structure and the actual word order as much as they can. In dynamic equivalence, they say, no, wait a minute, let's just try and convey the truth of that statement. Let's try and convey in modern language what that statement means. Well, it means the boy hit the ball. So let's say the boy hit the ball. All of our translations run somewhere up and down that continuum. So on the left-hand side would be the New American Standard Version that would probably be the most formal version around today. The New King James Version, that's also quite a formal equivalent. On this side here you would have what's called paraphrases. Uh, TM stands for the message. The message is quite popular. Eugene Peterson's The Message. Um, it's interesting to read. It's a huge paraphrase. So in other words, as he writes it, he's, he's not only translating, he's interpreting hugely. So it gives you good insights, but I would never ever use it as a, a study Bible. I would use it as a second or a third way of just getting another little insight. The New English Bible is a bit of a paraphrase as well, and it's quite a sectarian version. In other words, it, it comes at it from um, essentially the Episcopalian or the Anglican view of things, comes through in the translation of it. In the middle are two translations. One is the NIV, New America, the New International Version, and the NLT, the New Living Translation. Those two are the two that I would recommend that, uh, that you use as your regular study Bibles. Both of them are excellent. Frankly, almost any translation of the Bible that's around today is fine. I mean, really, I mean, even things like the uh, Jerusalem Bible, which is essentially a Roman Catholic Bible, for 99% of it is, is fine. So I wouldn't argue too much about it, and I wouldn't be insecure about, well, you know, this, this is a good one, and that's a terrible one. They're all okay. It's just that I would suggest you use the NIV or the NLT, because they are the most accurate and readable at the same time. You can read them. Um, Sunday I'm preaching a passage from the book of Hebrews. So what I did during the week is I took the New Living Translation, which I don't normally use, I normally use the NIV, and I read the entire book of Hebrews from that translation, in just in one sitting. It's not a big task, I mean it took an hour or whatever. But what a wonderful experience, because it put it so flowingly. I found myself caught up in this rolling narrative of how the Old Testament is explained. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. 